beginning to run out of time because this always takes a million times longer than it should and I want to honor our time schedule. So we're going to skip the unchecked and the checked and we're going to go right to a little mini case study to kind of get you ready for the bigger case study later. And this is a story I call the policy initiative. There should be ominous music. Dun, dun, dun. The story begins around the board table at a UU congregation. And Jack, who is a mitigation and mediation attorney, who had written our congregation's um, conflict resolution policy, was involved in a conflict with an employee, Ashley, who was our nursery care worker. The names have been changed to protect the guilty, by the way. And he came to the board and said, we have this conflict with our employee. We need a comprehensive conflict resolution policy for employees as well as members of the congregation. We need this thing, and I have written it. And I wish I was exaggerating his movements. And so Linda and Gary said, great idea. We absolutely do. We don't need conflict. Let's go with it. Let's go with it now. This is a shiny example. And Henry and Dorothy said, I don't know. We should probably form a committee. We need to, get, we need to hear from personnel. And we need to hear from the RE committee. And we should probably hear from finance. And we have another employment lawyer, we should call them and make sure that this is going to work. Meanwhile, Simon and Amelia are saying, we already have a grievance policy in our personnel policy. We don't need this. Why are we even talking about it? And poor Bob, the board president. <laughs> you could see the pain on his face and the struggle, and he didn't know what to do. So my first question to you is, what generations do you think these people belong to? <laughs> what about Jack? <laughs> All right, we'll skip Jack. What about Gary and Linda? They were, Jack's idea is great. We have to do Jack's idea. Interesting. How about Dorothy and Henry? Interesting. I'm hearing almost all four generations for everything. How about Simon and Amelia? And we don't know much about Bob. We just know Bob is hurting. <laughs> Actually, Jack is a boomer. Jack is a leading edge boomer who knows right and has a vision. And that can be amazing, but when that gets unchecked by leadership, Jack of the conflict resolution causes more conflict in the church than anybody else. <laughs> Gary and Linda side with him. They catch the vision. They are on board and they want everybody to have the vision. And again, unchecked, these boomers can run over everybody else. Poor Henry and Dorothy. They're older. They've been through the process a million times. They are our silence. They do want to make sure every voice is heard, which is great but can slow down a process. Simon and Amelia, our Xers, just want to do it and are not heard. Because what happened was Bob didn't really manage this right. Bob didn't say, well, let's look first at the policy and make sure we don't need it. Bob said, let's build this task force. And let's make sure Jack's on the task force. 
And they spent two months in meetings to discover that Simon and Amelia were right, that we didn't need it. And I tell this a little bit from a boomer or from an extra point of view because part of what happens if we're not paying attention and respecting all of the generational needs, a generation can be run over. And it doesn't help that Gen Xers are small in number. You know, at my board, it's mostly boomers and a Gen Xer and a silent gen. So the voices aren't heard. So that's what I'm trying to say. And it's not that Jack was necessarily wrong. We did need good conflict resolution. He probably should have checked. It's not that we didn't need to go through some processing. Maybe it wasn't clear how that was going. And I'm getting the wrap it up cue. <laughs> But it's just, it's an example of what we need to do. So I want to go kind of quickly, Gen Xers and Millennials, and I'm talking to boomers in silence right now. Gen Xers and Millennials want your trust. They want to try new things. They may not do it the way you like or the way you've done it before, but you have instilled in them a vision. They are here because you have instilled in them a vision of a beloved community and a faith that puts action within our community and outside in a greater world. You have done this. You have built this. And they want to carry that forward. They're strong. Their aim is true. And they want your trust. So a few tips, provide training in a variety of formats. This is great, but a lot of Xers have young families, can't get away for a Saturday. So think about webinars, think about after church with childcare. Allow them to reinvent the process. They may not do it the way you did it. And they may fail, it's okay. You can build your leaders through task force. Task, task forces. You guys want to build a new playground? Form a task force, focus, see how leaders emerge from that. And this is vital. Include spiritual formation in all leadership training. Because if their spirits aren't being formed, they might as well be leading Rotary. We are not Rotary. We have a vision of something greater. And to Gen Xers and Millennials, and don't think I'm, I'm only, you know, siding with them. We need to respect, appreciate, and be open to the wisdom and guidance. They have created this incredible vision. They have created and grown this incredible institution. And it's our charge to preserve it and to carry that flame for the next generations. This is our job. They've given us something amazing. So, generational dynamics, a tool in the toolbox. Are there any questions or comments? And I don't know how much time we have for questions or comments. About two minutes, okay, yes. Do you have a comment in your discussion about the formative dynamics in any of these given Right. I, well, and that's interesting because they weren't necessarily on the front lines. Later they were. Okay, when I go back, let me go back to all of that. Uh, back, 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 back is what I'm, oh, way back. Way back. Let's go. You're talking here. Way back. Generational types. Right, okay. So I, I, when I, said, I put the Cold War as the formative era, and all of that happened during the Cold War. Um, I guess when I think of the assassinations of RFK, MLK, and JFK, I think of why they were assassinated, and it largely had to do with civil rights and women's rights. <coughs> and, 
Sure, sure. Okay. That's fine. Yes. Oops, wait, wait, wait. Um, not a question, but a statement. Um, since this was done in 91, um, I think that the older generation has, um, you know, we objected to being called silent uh, right. because many of us were on many marches many times. Right. And um, uh, the second thing is uh, we didn't see ourselves quite um, like maybe perhaps our parents and think that, uh -huh. uh, that, that our generation is um, already been, we're looking at creating a new vision mm -hmm. of older people who right. age with purpose and passion. Right. Um, and so I think that's something. Yep. I think I'd it's like important to, to know why they were called the silent generation. Much like Gen X wound up not having a name because no one gave it to them or they kind of dismissed Gen X. Silence were called silence by the GIs who came back from war and saw, you know, and when asked, did you serve in the war, they were dumbstruck and they were, they were dumbfounded and they, they didn't have anything to say. And silence truly are anything but. But it's a name that was given. Boomers, you guys didn't choose your name. You know, the name is often given by previous generations. One, one more quick and then I'm being played off. <laughs> Is your PowerPoint presentation available for those of us that might want to share it with others in our congregation? Absolutely. In fact, there's also a videotape that will bring this as well. So, thank you.